So my name is Gadiminas Mikutis. I'm uh, the Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder of Hedexa. And by training, I'm a chemist. I came here to ETH to study chemical engineering, and then I met Michaela, and then we decided to uh, move the research that we were doing further, and then we co-founded Hedexa. And what does your startup do? So, so what we do is we mark materials early on in the supply chain, and then um, we mark them with the DNA. And from that point on, at any point throughout the supply chain, you can analyze the DNA of the material, and you can identify where it comes from. So this allows you to make claims about the supply chain of your material, which allows you to make uh, uh, claims such as uh, sustainability claims. Is it organic? Is it produced uh, free of child labor, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, what would be an example of how this tracing, this tracing with DNA on the supply chain, how that works? So if we take our most established example, if we take uh, the gemstone case, what, what we do there is uh, with our partners, we go to the individual mines. Um, so uh, in the case of emeralds, we go to Zambia or Zimbabwe. The mines are audited by a, an auditing company. Uh, to satisfy all the sustainability requirements. And at that point, a DNA is applied, a specific DNA code corresponding to that mine on that date. And then if, uh, the DNA is applied to the rough stone. Then uh, the rough stone is processed uh, in the same mine, then it's uh, exported to India, so it's cut, it's polished, uh, it's mounted on rings, then it arrives uh, in Europe. And then at any point, whether it's uh, somewhere during the cutting or uh, at retail level in Europe, you can analyze the DNA code and you identify it's coming from this specific mine and it's connected to this specific uh, auditing certificate. So you have the connection between uh, um, the standards, how it is produced, and the actual physical item. So it's not something written on the paper, which might be completely false, but it's inside the gemstone that you see where it comes from. And how does your product compare with the competition um, that exists in the market? So uh, people say if there is uh, no competition, there is no market. Uh, obviously, there is competition. Uh, we believe that we are better in many ways. So, so most of the competition that we are comparing ourselves to is the either paper trail, where you trace uh, the material with the paper certificates across the supply chain or blockchain, which is very fashionable today. And all of those, they, they are always disconnected from the item itself. So what happens quite often is that uh, you have paper showing it's all organic, it's all produced in a responsible way, but the material is moving in a completely different direction. And then there are scandals like uh, the one that just happened in China where the cotton is produced in a specific location and nobody wants to recognize that it goes into their supply chains. So there is hundreds of thousands of tons of cotton produced, and nobody knows where it goes because it's produced in a location that is not considered uh, uh, to respect human rights. So then you go to certain brands and you ask them, we believe it should be in your supply chain, and they say, no, our papers show it's not. But in reality, it might be very different. And we could also see this in India when we did our pilots there. The material is mixing so much. So there are, let's say, 200 farmers that were into the same collection center. Each of the farm has different uh, standards, how they work. Then from the collection centers, it goes to the ginning facilities where the seed cotton is separated from the uh, fluffy part of the cotton, so from the cotton that is used for textiles. And there again, it arrives from completely different locations with different sustainability rankings, with different uh, ways how uh, the cotton is produced and pesticide use and so on. And it's all mixing all the time. And then if you want to make a claim on the finished uh, garment, how it's produced, it's, it's very difficult. Mm, OK. And, and with your tracer, this is not possible? Well, with, with our solution, once you mark the cotton, it goes throughout the whole supply chain. And if you analyze a finished sweater, you can say it's coming from this specific location. So you have a proof 
of where it's coming from. You don't have a proof how it was produced. That's a, an add-on solution to ours. But you at least have a proof. It's really coming from this specific farm in this specific part of Egypt or wherever. So why did you decide to found a startup from your research project? So I, myself, I worked in startups before, before starting my PhD. And I liked the atmosphere. I liked uh, how much impact you have on the product. Because I also had experience from large industry. And I saw how small of a piece I am in a big machine. So I was always thinking uh, of uh, either working for a startup or making my own startup. And then I didn't really have an idea. So I said, I, I will do research in a group, in a research group where a lot of people start startups and potentially something good might turn out. And then I started doing that. And I somehow even forgot about the startup. I was motivated by the science behind it. But then at some point, we said, OK, we have to file a patent application based on what we are doing. And then you start thinking. When you, when you meet your patent attorneys, they start questioning you. So what, what industry should we cover? What markets are there? Uh, what are the competitor solutions? And that forces you a bit to think about the business. And then uh, Michaela was there, also very entrepreneurial, motivated to move forward. And then uh, we, after we submitted the patent application, we also started participating in some competitions. And uh, uh, after the first successes in the competitions, we, we had really positive feedback. We also found that uh, there are a couple of uh, companies interested in our product. And that's how we slowly started, without really forcing it. But we started, we got the first projects, and we had to hire our first engineers to help us develop a product. And yeah, now it's uh, slowly growing. <laughs> Maybe a bit slower than uh, what uh, we planned and what we expected. But it's, I think, almost always the case. And do you, do you think you could have started anywhere in the world? Or was it really a big advantage to found a startup here in Switzerland? I, I think. ETH Zurich gives a lot of freedom for research. Uh, th there is more freedom than uh, pretty much anywhere else. And that's a really big advantage to if you want to develop uh, uh, technologies early on. In terms of uh, then moving from research to the next level to, to trying to commercialize it, I think when we started, it was only kicking off in Switzerland. So the startup environment was there, but it was not huge. But still, in Switzerland, there, there are financial resources. So there are a lot of competitions. There is some support from ETH Zurich. We got the Pioneer Fellowship to first develop the technology. So I, I think overall, the conditions are very good. But I wouldn't say that it's not possible to do it elsewhere. It also depends on the technology you are developing. If you are developing a technology that is based on chemistry and requires a lot of development in the lab, that comes with a, quite some infrastructure costs. And for that, ETH is a perfect location. But if you, if you work on simpler engineering solutions or on IT, that, is fully, that can be fully done also outside of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. What are maybe things that are not so good for startups in Switzerland? Uh, I think some of the challenges uh, include the perception towards work. So, so I think in Switzerland, people are overall, in terms of working hours, people say in Switzerland, people work a lot. But uh, not so many people have this startup attitude. Ah, let's push it through. Let's stay until midnight and let's make it. We have a. A lot of people that we also, uh, during the hiring process we experience, they say, yeah, 5 PM, I go home. Uh, it doesn't matter that the deadline is tonight for the project and that it's not finished. 5 PM, I go home. So I think that that's the, sometimes this kick, this extra motivation is lacking here that you, I believe, especially in the US, you see it much more. But overall, it's also healthy to have a some somewhat a balance between uh, uh, your work life and your private life, if you manage. 
in your opinion, what kind of mentality is necessary to either found a startup or work at one? So again, in, in Switzerland, I think the, the, there are a few changes, a few, a few big changes. Uh, if you are working for a large company compared to a startup, first, financially, you are obviously less free. If you, if you work in a startup, you don't have a secure basic income. And you also don't have security for the next five years, 10 years. Uh, it's up to you if you like that or not. I think uh, there is a change in the society, especially if you talk to young people, they also don't want this stability for the next five years or 10 years. So I think that's not uh, against startups. It's uh, just a different mentality and it's not worse if you don't have the stability, if you can uh, deal with that. And uh, there is also a difference in how you work. So in, in a startup, we, we also always say that it, to me, it matters way less how many hours you put in, matters mo much more what you achieve in that time. Whereas in, in a larger company, you still have your working hours. You do it uh, if it's a uh, quarter to six and you think uh, the next project would take me one hour, I will not start it even today. I will just chill for 15 minutes and go home. Whereas in a startup, you think, OK, I, <laughs> I will push this project and maybe one more after if it's a deadline. So th this is definitely one thing. I think a second thing that we realize now more and more is uh, the agility, the ability to adapt to the changing environment. So in, in our case, what happens is that we change priorities uh, Sometimes after one customer call who says, you know, if I deliver this by next week, we can move forward much faster. And then the whole team has to be able to adapt to it. So then we have to be able to change the schedule, how we work, how we operate. And this, uh, if you manage to do this well, it's good. But I noticed that some people also don't like to change plans so much. They want to have a schedule where you know, OK, this week I do that. Next week I will do something else. I have a fixed schedule. And if you will come up to me with a new project, I will take it, let's say, in a month or in two months. But now I'm full. And in our case, we very often need to adapt. This afternoon, plans have changed. I do something else. Was it a challenge for you, you know, to adapt from being a researcher to being an entrepreneur? I wouldn't say so. I, I was never this uh, very long term planning kind of person. So for, for me, it, it's, uh, it has never been a challenge. And I think it's also easier if you're a founder to adapt it because you see the full picture. You see the customer's demand. You see, you see how busy the team is. I think it's not so difficult to adapt. I think it's much more challenging to adapt if you are an engineer in a startup company where you plan your schedule, you plan your day, and then your boss comes to you and tells you, hey, by the way, change your plans. What you did this morning doesn't matter. Now we start something new. I think that can be quite harsh. And I'm happy that our team is really flexible and really good with this. If you explain it to them well, they always appreciate it. But, uh, I see this uh, as not straightforward. And I understand if people are hesitant if you tell them we need to change what we do. In your experience, what is different from your expectation of being a startup entrepreneur and how it really is? Uh, that's <laughs> a good question. So I think. In the end, it's not that far from my expectation. So before I started the company, it's, it's not that far from what I expected back then. Um, I expected it's going to be a lot of work. I expected there would be uh, a lot of ups and downs. Probably what I mm, didn't expect is what kinds of ups and downs there would be, because when, when you listen to People sharing their startup stories, they, they usually talk about the product, about the clients. In our case, uh, we, we face uh, also different kinds of challenges. Intellectual property is a big topic. Human resources, uh, motivating the team, uh, hiring new members in the team. 
all of those have a more ups and downs than the product itself. But I guess this you can never plan, so, so you, you never know what kind of uh, challenges you would have. And how do you learn new skills um, as an entrepreneur? Um, we have a group of advisors uh, for different topics to advise us on. So uh, if we take a case of human resources, we had some challenges uh, with internal communication in the team, how, how to keep it up to the level with a growing team. And for that, we, we got uh, an advisor who works in the human resources uh, professionally. And she spent a few days with us to uh, help first the management, but also the whole team to address this internal communication challenge. Uh, in some other cases, you can, uh, I think you can learn a lot online. Uh, <laughs> there are a, a lot of good articles on, on uh, any kind of management issue, because also management is something that uh, I think many people take for granted without studying, and that takes time to learn. And then I think still the startups are known for learning by doing. So I think we make a lot of mistakes, but we, we learn from them. And that's uh, really important to move forward. And uh, with uh, each of the, these downsides, uh, we had some uh, mistakes that we made. But I think we are getting much better. <laughs> What would you tell? What would you tell somebody you know who asks you if they should become an entrepreneur with their own startup? Uh, so, in general, I always say yes, you should do it. <laughs> it's a smaller risk than people think. I believe people think uh, making a startup it's a it's a huge risk for me financially in terms of time and so on. I believe it. You learn so much, and the worst outcome could be that you don't make it, and then you get a job and you do something else. To me, it's not the end of the world. I think everybody could take this risk if they're up for it. Um, and here, uh, we have the startup environment where actually I go also to other startups and talk to them how, how they solve certain problems. And uh, at any given point of time, people also come to us and they ask us, how, how did you do this? How did you do that? Should I do this at all? So we have this environment where I also always say, you know, you, you ask me, I'm one person, go to these three other startups, talk to them. They might have very opposing views from mine and then make your own mind. I don't want to be the one who says you do this or you don't do this. It's in the end, up to the person. And it, it's also a nice thing at ETH Zurich. There are uh, 10, 20 other startups here on the campus. You can talk to anyone, and people are available, and people are supportive. So I, I think that way you, you learn m much more what a startup is like, because in the end, every startup is a bit different. And it's also how, how you, as a person, approach a startup. Some people love it, some other people don't. We also had people who worked for our company and they decided not to continue working anymore because they felt this is not an environment for us. And that's also fair enough. So for me, just saying, yeah, you have to do it. Uh, I mean, in my case, it works, but not for everyone. <laughs> for you, what is the main motivation of having your own startup? It's uh, motivating on many different levels. First, we have a really amazing team. I, I love to work with this team. And here we share, share the views, how, how we work, how we move forward. And this you don't always have in other companies. Whereas uh, in a, a startup, people are always driven much more by the idea than by uh, let's say financial revenue sold by the work itself. Uh, so that's one big factor. The other factor is that I like to feel that I can do things. <laughs> it's uh, simply being able to also move all the way from uh, doing science in the lab to 
uh, customer negotiations and then a product on the market that's uh, really powerful and that's uh, motivating me daily. That's really encouraging. And I think it also allows our whole team to experience that. So everybody has seen the whole cycle from some experiments where we mix the chemicals to the end product in the end, and that's really encouraging. How important is it for you to make an impact in the world with your startup? It's, uh, of course, more motivating to do things that you believe can change uh, uh, the way things work today. So that's definitely motivating. If I think about all the work I've done, so I worked in the pharmaceuticals before, and there I worked in a large company, 100,000 people worldwide. Uh, I also saw that because I, I was uh, thinking, OK, me, myself, I, I have very little influence on, on the finished product. It's, I'm one in a really big machine where I influence very little. But I was still seeing that I'm uh, moving uh, a certain development of a certain drug forward. So I think that is, of course, more motivating. I would imagine that I could also work in areas where it is, uh, let's say, less uh, impactful. Um, so you don't always have to work on AI or biotech or nanotech. I imagine myself doing social service and enjoying it too, because I see the purpose of that. So I think as long as I see a purpose, it's motivating for me. And uh, I, I have done quite a lot of volunteering as well, where I was working. Uh, I spent almost a year in Vietnam working with disabled children. And to me, that was just as meaningful, way more exhausting than a startup, but just as meaningful. So it doesn't always have to be the role changing, uh, but I need to see a purpose in what I do. Do you think there is a difference between running a company maybe 10 or 20 years ago and today? I, I think the, the how people run companies adapts uh, to the demand on the market. So, so if you would ask people what, what are the key challenges in the world today, you would find startups on all those challenges. So it's the climate change, it's sustainability, it's uh, new diseases and so on. It's AI, of course, because those are the things revolutionizing the, the world. And that's what's motivating people to, to spend time and innovate in those areas. So I, I think it's somewhat natural. Um, I think what's changing over time is that uh, there are more resources for startups. And uh, startups are getting more professional in the way they run business. So I, I see quite a difference uh, if I compare the startup environment here in Switzerland, let's say people from whom we are collecting advice to us, to even younger companies. People get more and more advice, and they run it more and more professionally. Because typically, if you run a startup, you come very often from a technical field, and you are for sure not the best manager. <laughs> That's a, a fact, and you have to learn that. And I think now there are a lot of tools to learn that. So in terms of that, I think there is a big change in the society and how, how successful the startups are because of that. I think you need a certain environment, uh, a certain minimal threshold of startups to, to have this uh, exchange of uh, ideas and also the advisory network to be able to run it in a more professional way that then has more chances for success for the success of the technology, which is uh, uh, people often see, see it as disconnected. Sometimes good technologies fail because they are mismanaged. What is the dream that you have for your startup? Uh, the dream that I have for the company is to uh, grow it into a sustainable business. So it, it should stand on its own. It, uh, should have a, an impact on the society as much as possible. So in the end, 
it's not the Hedex uh, solution alone that solves uh, the supply chain transparency issues, but it's a combination of tools. And if we are part of that combination of tools that helps supply chains be more sustainable, it's very rewarding. In your opinion, for a startup to become successful, what is the most important thing? I think the team is uh, crucial. So the, the team with which you choose to found and grow a startup is really crucial. First, uh, in our case, uh, I'm really happy to work with Michaela because with Michaela we are two very different people. We are very stubborn and we oppose each other so often that in the end I believe it helps make much better decisions compared to two people that would be always on the same side and always agreeing. So I think this is very helpful, provided you can communicate well. And I think we manage it uh, decently well. And then besides the founders, also the, the broader team, so, so the, the first hires, the, the people with whom you spend time, they, they, they have to also be there to push you when you are down. It's, uh, everybody has their ups and downs, and you can uh, mediate them on a personal level. But if you have a team who, when you are tired, say, no, let's just push through, that's also very crucial. So I, I think first, the founding team, second, uh, the extended team. Both have to help you first make better decisions, and second, uh, push you forward when uh, the times are more difficult.